the chromosomal disorders and cytogenetic diagnostics so this is placed first in the series of talks in today's workshop because cytogenetics is considered a primary or a fundamental component in the vast field of human genetics and when we consider about the clinical genetics the cytogenetic or the chromosomal disorders account for a large proportion of the burden of genetic disorders uh, among human so in my brief talk i'll be discussing about the classification of the chromosomal abnormalities and the burden of chromosomal abnormalities in our setting with some examples from our own research that we have conducted in the human genetics unit and in the second part of this session i'll be talking about the cytogenetic diagnostic methods and their clinical applications so in the genetic clinic we see patients from the very first day of their life and in some settings even before birth in the antenatal period up to the late age in their old age and this patient present with diverse group of clinical presentations so as clinical genetics when we see this type of patients we have one question in our mind first so we think whether it is a chromosomal defect or it whether it is caused by a gene defect or a mutation so the focus of my lecture will be on the chromosomal defects and there will be a series of uh, uh, talks we are the panelist will discuss the genetic disorders caused by different gene defects or the mutations so about the chromosomal abnormalities as i told you earlier they can manifest in the antenatal life and present at birth with multiple dysmorphic features the congenital abnormalities including ambiguous genitalia and if not detected at birth they may present at different stages of life with different presentations for example in early childhood they may present with the developmental delay or the intellectual disabilities in the teenage years they may might come with the delayed puberty or the primary amenorrhea or later in life in early adulthood they may come with the infertility or the recurrent pregnancy loss how it is important to note that there are some patients who carries the chromosomal abnormalities but will not manifest any clinical conditions because they have the balanced chromosomal rearrangements which i will discuss later but they will present with the abnormalities in their children and there is another set of people who will develop chromosomal abnormalities later in their life which we call the acquired chromosomal abnormalities which is very frequently discussed in relation to the hemato oncology so moving on to the chromosomal disorders in the genetics clinics the majority of the cases with the chromosomal disorders that we see are due to the aneuploidy syndromes and the structural chromosomal abnormalities we all know that the trisomy 21 or the down syndrome is one of the commonest genetic disorders in the whole world but we also see a significant number of trisomy 18 edward syndrome and the trisomy 13 patau syndrome cases and with a lot of sex chromosomal trisomies mainly the kleinfelter syndrome and when we talk about the monosomies we know that the autosomal complete autosomal monosomies in the embryo or the fetus are usually not viable so what we see commonly in the genetic clinic is the monosomy x or the turner syndrome but when we discuss about the structural chromosomal abnormalities it is, it is much more diverse because these structural chromosomal abnormalities can affect any of the 22 autosome pairs or the two x two sex chromosomes so if a structural chromosomal rearrangement does not cause any chrom gain or loss of the chromosomal material they will be clinically silent and they will be known as balanced chromosomal rearrangements 
Sometimes these chromosomal rearrangement will cause a loss or a gain of the chromosomal material leading to a partial trisomy or a partial monosomy, and they will be the unbalanced chromosomal rearrangements. In the next few slides, I'll be talking about our experience in the human genetics unit where we studied the uh, epidemiology, the pattern and the types of the chromosomal abnormalities. So in this study, we analyzed the data for 10 years of about 3,800 children. And interestingly, you can see about 50% of these children who are referred for karyotyping had chromosomal abnormalities. We have to thank all the clinicians, the medical practitioners who have referred this patient and also have to give credit to them because they have accurately suspected the genetic etiology in these children. So the target of this workshop is also to increase that awareness so that you will be able to refer the correct patients when you have the suspicion of the genetic etiology. So I want to highlight few points in this uh, slide. You can see the magnitude of the problem of the trisomy syndromes, which account for a large number of cases here. And more importantly, you can see a significant number of translocation Down syndrome cases, which has the possibility of recurring in those families. So in the previous slide, you saw that the translocation account for about 50% of all the structural chromosomal abnormalities. And when we did the analysis, irrespective of the age, again, the results were the same. And you can see the patients with the chromosomal translocation can present with diverse clinical presentations, commonly the dysmorphism, the congenital abnormalities, developmental delay and intellectual disabilities in children, recurrent pregnancy loss among women, and the subfertility in couples. Here you see a few of the cases that uh, we detected in the human genetics unit and uh, that has been published. And in summary, what I want to highlight is that the chromosomal disorders are not rare and they can present with diverse range of clinical presentations. And if you have a patient with any of the indications that I have uh, discussed previously, it is always good to have a high degree of suspicion and refer them for the genetic analysis so that you will be able to prevent the recurrence of a similar type of event in those families and you may be able to direct them for the correct management. So if, you have a, if we have a patient with the suspected chromosomal abnormality, <coughs> sorry, so how we are going to diagnose them? So that is by different cytogenetic diagnostic methods. It has been about 65 years since the, that we know that the human have uh, 46 chromosome, which was described only in 1956. And from that day, there had been a tremendous improvement in the field of genetics, in the genetic diagnostics. But still, the cytogenetics plays a very vital role in the field of genetic diagnosis. But with the improvement in the field of the genetics and the technologies involved, there had been an improvement in the cytogenetic diagnostic methods. So he started with the conventional karyotyping and then the fluorescent in situ hybridization came in, which has been practiced for years now. And the newest additions are the microarray based techniques where it is the array CGH. So these methods I'll discuss in brief in a few minutes. So the cytogenetic analysis can be done using different types of tissues with different types of cells, depending on the indication. Commonly, we see the peripheral blood karyotyping. We perform the peripheral blood karyotyping for the patients who are referred to us for the, due to the congenital abnormalities, disorders of sex development, infertility, the recurrent pregnancy loss, and so on. And we have a significant number of patients who were referred for the bone marrow karyotyping or fish analysis 
due to the hemato-oncological conditions. The myelodysplastic syndromes, myeloproliferative disorders, as well as the hematological malignancies. And the cytogenetic analysis is also performed on uh, as a part of the prenatal diagnosis and the pre-implantation genetic testing. So moving on to the first method, the karyotyping, the ground-rooted method in the cytogenetic analysis, where we culture the cells and observe the metaphase chromosomes, look at their banding patterns and try to analyze the structural as well as the numerical abnormalities in the chromosomes. So if you see this type of a patient with the microcephaly, the polydactyly, the overlapping fingers, rocker bottom feet, with the other abnormalities, which is highly suggestive of a certain clinical syndrome, some might think we might not need a karyotyping. Of course, as the medical practitioners, you will not need a karyotype or a karyogram to diagnose a patient with Down syndrome. So why we need to perform karyotyping in these cases? Because it will not be always a straightforward, complete trisomy cases as in this case. So it could be something like this, where one of the parents have a balanced translocation and which pose the trisomy in the babies. So if you did not perform the karyotype, you will miss this type of cases and those families will have another child with a similar uh, condition. So that is the importance of performing the karyotyping for these conditions. To give you another example from our clinic, so this is a, uh, so here you see a karyogram of a child presented with Kriduchar syndrome. And we know it is caused by a, terminal deletion of the short arm of the chromosome 5. And there is a characteristic set of clinical features that allows you to diagnose this syndrome clinically. However, we need to know that about 5 to 10 percent or sometimes even more than that of the Kriduchar syndrome is due to the chromosomal translocation, which might be inherited, which can be inherited from the parents. As you see in this case, where the father has a translocation between the chromosome 5 and the chromosome 8. So as a result, the derivative, derivative chromosome 5 lacks a part of the short term of the chromosome 5, which is inherited by the child leading into this syndrome. So moving on to the next type, the second type of the cytogenetic analysis, the fluorescent in situ hybridization which is very commonly done in our setting for the diagnosis of the hematological, hemato-oncological conditions, as you see here, the 5Q deletion syndrome in the myelodysplastic syndromes. And the, as the name implies, fluorescent in situ hybridization means that there's a hybridization of a fluorescently labeled probe to a DNA targeted DNA segment, which will allow you to diagnose them by the microscopic examination. So this is one of the very few instances that we learn about the genetics in uh, the medical schools when we are students about 10 to 15 years ago, where you see the translocation between the chromosome 9 and 22 leading to BCR-ABL fusion and the formation of Philadelphia chromosome in the chronic myeloid leukemia. So this is also diagnosed using the FISH technology. But the application of FISH is not only limited to the hemato-oncology, it is also used in the prenatal diagnosis and the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to detect the chromosomal abnormalities. Moving on to the third, method of the cytogenetic analysis, the comparative genomic hybridization or the CGH and the microarray-based comparative genomic hybridization or the array CGH, they involve a similar procedure. We are the DNA samples, two DNA samples, one from the patient and one from a normal individual is hybridized either into a metaphase 
into metaphase chromosomes in case of CGH or into the array in case of array CGH. So this array CGH will provide you with a virtual karyogram with very high resolution image of the copy number variations. As you see here, a deletion. So it will give you a very high resolution image regarding the deletion and duplications in the genome of the subject or in the set of cells which are analyzed in case of cancer. But the array CGS will not detect the balanced chromosomal rearrangement. So each of these cytogenetic analysis method has their own strengths and the weaknesses. So it is so when you have a patient who might need a cytogenetic analysis, it is always necessary to correctly decide what is the most accurate or the best method of analysis for each of these patients with the consultation with the expert in that field. And sometimes these patients might need more than one type of test. And there, the sequence of testing also has to be carefully decided. So as an example, I have here added a simple case scenario that we have published, where there is a child who presented with multiple congenital abnormalities and the dysmorphic features with a significant family history, who was found to have a uh, trisomy 7q in, due to the inheritance of a balanced chromosomal translocation from the mother. Here you see uh, how we confirm the cases using the other two technologies, the FISH and the array technology. And we'll be discussing these cases in detail at the, towards the end of the workshop when we have the discussion session. Thank you very much.